this is from an essay called uh, That Crafty Feeling. And it's just about what it feels like to write a novel. Um, it's in ten parts, and I'm just going to read from four till the end. Four. Middle of the novel, magical thinking. In the middle of a novel, a kind of magical thinking takes over. To clarify, the middle of the novel may not happen in the actual geographical center of the novel. By middle of the novel, I mean whatever page you're on, when you stop being part of your household and your family and your partner and children and food shopping and dog feeding and reading the post. I mean when there's nothing in the world except your book. E even as your wife tells you she's sleeping with your brother, her face is a gigantic semicolon, her arms a parenthesis, and you're wondering whether rummage is a better verb than rifle. The middle of a novel is a state of mind. Strange things happen in it. Time collapses. You sit down to write at 9 a.m., you blink, the evening news is on, and 4,000 words are written, more words than you wrote in three long months a year ago. Something has changed. And it's not restricted to the house. If you go outside, everything, I mean everything, flows freely into your novel. Someone on the bus says something, it's straight out of your novel. You open the paper. Every single story in the paper is directly relevant to your novel. If you're fortunate enough to have someone waiting to publish your novel, this is the point at which you phone them in a panic and try to get your publication date moved forward because you can't believe how in tune the world is with your unpublished novel right now. And if it isn't published next Tuesday, maybe the moment will pass and you'll have to kill yourself. Magical thinking makes you crazy and renders everything possible. Incredibly knotty problems of structure now resolve themselves with inspired ease. See that one paragraph? It only needs to be moved and the whole chapter falls into place. But why didn't you see it before? You randomly pick a poetry book off the shelf and the first line you read ends up being your epigraph. It seems to have been written for no other reason. Five, dismantling the scaffolding. When building a novel, you'll use a lot of scaffolding. Some of this is necessary to hold the thing up, but most isn't. The majority of it is only there to make you feel secure, and in fact, the building will stand without it. Each time I've written a long piece of fiction, I felt this need for an enormous amount of scaffolding. With me, scaffolding comes in many forms. The only way to write this novel is to divide it into three sections of ten chapters each, or five sections of seven chapters, or the answer is to read the Old Testament and model each chapter on the books of the prophets or the divisions of the Bhagavad Gita, or the Psalms, or Ulysses, or the Songs of Public Enemy, or the films of Grace Kelly, or the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, or the liner notes to the White Album, or the 27 speeches Donald Rumsfeld gave to the press corps during his tenure. Scaffolding holds up confidence when you have none, reduces the despair, creates a goal, however artificial, an end point. Use it to divide what seems like an endless, unmarked journey though by doing this, like Zeno, you infinitely extend the distance you need to go. Later, when the book is printed and old and dog-eared, it occurs to me that I really didn't need any of that scaffolding. The book would have been far, off better, would have been far better off without it. But when I was putting it up, it felt vital, and once it was there, I worked so hard to get it there, I was loath to take it down. If you're writing a novel at the moment and putting up scaffolding, well, I hope it helps you but don't forget to dismantle it later. Or if you're determined to leave it up, out there for all to see, at least hang a nice facade over it, as the Romans do when they fix up their palazzi. Six, the first 20 pages, redux, because I talked about the first 20 pages earlier on. Late in the novel, in the last quarter, when I'm rolling downhill, I turn back to read those first 20 pages. They're packed tighter than tuna in a can. Calmly, I take off the top, let a little air in. What's amusing about the first 20 pages, they're funny now. Three years later, now I'm no longer locked up in them. It's how little confidence you have in your readers when you begin. You spoon-feed them everything. You can't let a character walk across the room without giving her backstory as she goes. You don't trust the reader to have a little patience, a little intelligence. This reader, who for all you know, has read Thomas Bernhardt, Finnegan's Wake, Gertrude Stein, George Perec. 
Yet you're worried that if you don't mention in the first three pages that Sarah Malone is a social worker with a dead father, this talented reader might not be able to follow you exactly. <laughs> it's awful, the swing of the literary fraudulence pendulum. From moment to moment, you can't decide whether you're the fraudulent idiot or your reader is the fraudulent idiot. For writers who work with character a good deal, going back to those first 20 pages is also a lesson in how much more delicate a thing character is than you think it is when you're writing it. The idea of forming people out of grammatical clauses seems so fantastical at the start that you hide your terror in a smokescreen of elaborate sentence making, as if character can be drawn forcibly out of the curlicues of certain adjectives piled ruthlessly on top of one another. In fact, character occurs with the lightest of brushstrokes. Naturally, it can be destroyed lightly, too. I think of a cre creature called Odredek, who at first glance appears to be a flat, star-shaped spool for thread, but who is not quite this. Odredek, who won't stop rolling down the stairs, trailing string behind him, who has a laugh that sounds as if it has no lungs behind it, a laugh like rustling leaves. You can find the inimitable Odredek in a one-page story of Kafka's called The Cares of a Family Man. Curious Odredek is more memorable to me than characters I spent three years on and 500 pages. Seven, the last day. There's one great advantage to being a micromanager rather than a macro planner. The last day of your novel truly is the last day. If you edit as you go along, there are no first, second, third drafts. There's only one draft, and when it's done, it's done. Who can find anything bad to say about the last day of a novel? It's a feeling of happiness that knocks me clean out of adjectives. I think sometimes that the best reason for writing novels is to experience those four and a half hours after you write the final word. The last time it happened to me, I uncorked a good Sancerre I'd been keeping and drank it standing up with a bottle in my hand. And then I lay down in my backyard on the paving stones and stayed there for a long time, crying. It was sunny, late autumn, and there were apples everywhere overripe and stinky. Eight, step away from the vehicle. You can ignore everything else in this lecture except number eight. It's the only absolutely 24 karat gold-plated piece of advice I have to give you. I've never taken it myself, though one day I hope to. The advice is as follows. When you finish your novel, if money is not a desperate priority, if you don't need to sell it at once or for it to be published that very second, put it in a drawer for as long as you can manage. A year or more is ideal, but even three months will do. Step away from the vehicle. The secret to editing your work is simple. You need to become its reader instead of its writer. I can't tell you how many times I've sat backstage with a line of novelists at some festival, all of us with red pens in hand, frantically editing our published novels into fit form so that we might go on stage and read from them. It's an unfortunate thing, but it turns out the perfect state of mind to edit your own novel is two years after it's published, ten minutes before you go on stage at a literary festival. <laughs> at that moment, every redundant phrase, each show-off, pointless metaphor, all the pieces of deadwood, stupidity, vanity, and tedium are distressingly obvious to you. Two years earlier, when the proofs came, you looked at the same pages and couldn't see a comma out of place. And by the way, that's true of the professional editors too. After they've read a manuscript multiple times, they stop being able to see it. You need a certain head on your shoulders to edit a novel. And it's not the head of a writer in the thick of it, nor the head of a professional editor who's seen it in 12 different versions. It's the head of a smart stranger who picks it up off a bookshelf and begins to read. You need to get the head of that smart stranger somehow. You need to forget you ever wrote that book. Nine the unbearable cruelty of proofs. Proofs are so cruel, breeding lilacs out of the dead land, mixing memory and desire, stirring dull roots with spring rain. Proofs are the wasteland where the dream of your novel dies and cold reality asserts itself. When I look at loose leaf proofs fresh out the envelope bound with a thick elastic band marked up by a conscientious copy editor, I feel quite sure I would have to become a different person entirely to do the work that needs to be done here, to correct what needs correcting, fix what needs to be fixed. The only proper response to an envelope full of marked up pages is give it back to me, let me start again.
But no one says this because by this point, exhaustion has set in. It's not the book you hoped for. Maybe something might yet be done. But the will is gone. There's simply no more will to be had. That's why proofs are so cruel, so sad. The existence of the proof itself is proof that it's already too late. I've only ever seen one happy proof in King's College Library, the manuscript of Eliot's The Wasteland. Eliot, upon reaching his own point of exhaustion, had the extreme good fortune to meet Ezra Pound, a very smart stranger. And with his red pen, Ezra went to work. And what work? His pen goes everywhere, trimming, cutting, slicing, a frenzy of editing. The why and wherefore, not especially obvious, at times indeed almost ridiculous, almost at times indiscriminate. Whole pages stuck out, struck out with a single line. Underneath Pound's marking, the wasteland is a sad proof like any other, too long, full of lines not worth keeping, badly structured. Lucky Elliot to have Ezra Pound. Lucky Fitzgerald to have Maxwell Perkins. Lucky Carver, we now know, to have Gordon Lish. Where have all the smart strangers gone? Ten, ten years later, nausea, surprise, and feeling okay. I find it very hard to read my books after they're published. I've never read White Teeth. Five years ago, I tried. I got about ten sentences in before I was overwhelmed with nausea. More recently, when people tell me they've just read that book, I do try to feel pleased. But it's a distant, disconnected sensation, like when someone tells you they met your second cousin in a bar in Goa. I suspect White Teeth and I may never be reconciled. I think that's simply what happens when you begin writing a book at the age of 21. Then, a while ago, I was in an airport somewhere and I saw a copy of The Autograph Man, and on a whim I bought it. On the plane, I had to drink two of those mini bottles of wine before I had the stomach to begin. I didn't manage the whole thing, but I read about two-thirds, and at that incredible speed with which you can read a book if you happen to have written it. <laughs> and it was actually not such a bad experience. I laughed a few times, I groaned more than I laughed, and I gave up when the wine wore off. But for the first time, I felt something other than nausea. I felt surprise. The book was genuinely strange to me. There were whole pages I didn't recognize. I didn't remember writing. And because it was so strange, I didn't feel any particular animosity towards it. So that was that. Between that book and me, there now exists a sort of blank truce, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Finally, while writing this lecture, I picked up on beauty. I read maybe a third of it, not consecutively, but chapters here and there. As usual, the nausea, as usual, the feeling of fraudulence, and the too late desire to wield the red pen all over the place. But something else too, something new. Here and there, in very isolated pockets, I had the sense that this line, that paragraph, these were exactly what I meant to write. And the fact was I'd written them, and I felt okay about it. Felt good, even. It's a feeling I recommend to all of you. I was talking to a writing students. That feeling feels okay. Thanks. Thank